welcome. This is Leo Krakowski. This is his exhibition, Lion Eyes. So welcome and thank you everyone for braving the weather and coming to see this amazing soft-spoken artist's work. <laughs> thank you. So what makes you so interested in bronze? Um, what makes me so interested in bronze is mostly that it's so old. Uh, I think it forms a symbol of eternity, almost. Um, one of the first series of bronzes I was interested in are the Benin bronzes mm -hmm. from the ancient kingdom of Benin and, well, what is now Benin in Africa. And since my first encounter with them in that sense, when I was researching them in the academic context, um, I've gone deeper and deeper into the history of the material, and it seems like since time, since we started recording time, we've treated this material as a way of venerating things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that one substance should be the vessel for so much veneration. That's mm -hmm. the core of my interest in it. Sure. Hence the term to lionize, to celebrate. To celebrate, to lionize. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to speak to the paintings and how you acquire these works? I know you mentioned in the statement there that each work is sort of a different case of ac acquisition, and then the titles for the work sort of reflect that. Yeah, that's true. Um, each of these represents maybe the end point of a narrative where this piece arrives in my hands. Some of them are pieces I've purchased from artists. Um, at least one of them is something I found in an abandoned building. Uh, one of them is a painting by uh, a, a blind painter who paints in order to maintain the connection to the world of sight. One of them is a portrait that a painter made of me, and that's one of the pieces that didn't survive the process. In order to make one of these, I tore apart a portrait of my own face. One of them was a gift and also a goodbye. Uh, someone really loved that I was doing this series but really didn't love that I was making this series exist because it was uh, such a strong challenge to painting and to ownership. So it was given to me as a token of artistic uh, respect or generosity, but also to symbolize the end of a professional relationship. Wow, that's yeah. a strong reaction. Uh, were there any other strong reactions of opposition or in that case it's interesting because they still participated in your gesture here. Yeah, um, I think this this series is very much about tensions, you know, there's that tension between, you know, in this case, uh, respecting that someone would be doing this series and that this statement should exist, but on the other hand, not liking that something like mm -hmm. this exists. Would it be all right if I took one of your pieces and made a copy of it in marble, like the Romans did, and then melted down the work for mm -hmm. cannonball purposes of my own? Well, it depends what you mean by okay. It, de it depends what you mean by the word okay. Would it be morally okay? No. <laughs> so I would be defacing history. But what I'm trying to say is that I don't think these are very sentimental works. Uh, it would hurt me, personally, if you, my friend, destroyed one. That said, they're the kind of object that invites that kind of treatment. These things, I think of them as living in that one of the elements in the field that these things operate in is trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, I patinate them, which means to give them color, to give them the surface by burying them, leaving them outside in the elements, you know, exposing them to things that I wouldn't want to be exposed to. Um, so in a way, the kind of abuse that you're talking about is one of their dimensions. Oh, okay, so, um, series, working in series. Mm -hmm. So are you going to continue working in series? Where, will there be a shift in this direction you're going with, or is it going to be an expansive thing you're doing here? Uh, that continues in the same vein for some time. I mean, to me, the most interesting part is the narratives behind acquisition and the titles that reflect those narratives for me, mm -hmm. aside from obviously the other element, which for me references the erased de Kooning sort of concept that sure. came out 
yeah. in, uh, I guess that was the 50s, when Rauschenberg erased a famous abstract expressionist work. Do we all know that story? Okay. Some of us don't. Um, once upon a time, there was a young artist, and there was an older artist who was very well established. And the younger artist went to the older artist and said, I'd really like to uh, take all of the picture out of one of your paintings in order to make a statement about painting. And he was turned away and you know, told to leave. And then came back to the studio and uh, expressed that same idea more passionately. And the more established artist gave him one of his own paintings and said, okay, erase this. And there's this thing by Rosenberg, the younger artist, called the Erased de Kooning, the older artist, which is an almost white picture where you can just barely see where there used to be something else on it. And I think that removal in general is an interesting thing for artists to consider because anyone who's I think everyone can relate to the feeling of a very beautiful, pristine potentiality in very nice material, for example. Like when you see a really nice piece of paper or a really nice piece of wood that hasn't received too much creative attention or intention, there's a feeling that art almost never will instill in an audience that comes from seeing that material. And the idea of returning an art object to that state of potentiality is fascinating to me. And I think that that's the other side of destroying artwork, hmm. which uh, is part of the process of creating I this think, work. Um, getting back to concrete things, the material processes here, mm -hmm. you include lockets from soldiers of World War One and Two, and teapots and, you know, just old cherished objects. And which works do you select for that? And is there a purpose behind that, or is it just a subtle, poetic gesture that you include in the manifestation of these objects as you produce them? So, in case anyone here hasn't had a chance to totally familiarize themselves with the work, this is bronze that's been adulterated with metal antiquities. So, there are some lockets from soldiers from the First World War in here. There are, there's a hundred and eighty, no almost 210 year old silver tea service that's been melted into here. There's a, a wedding ring that um, belonged to someone who didn't, who really didn't want their old wedding ring anymore. Um, now we're, uh, okay, so just for example, was that wedding ring related to the acquisition or is this a separate sentiment that goes in? That was an interesting thing because that was from someone who heard I was making this work and they thought, oh, this is great, because I've wanted to destroy this wedding ring for a while, and this seems like the perfect poetic means to do so. The poetry of this <laughs> series allowed them a means in which to access that... Uh, Valuable object, access, sentimental or otherwise. Sure, but to access that profound, ungraspable, in this case, destruction, mm. because they never found a way during their daily life, but the poetry of this made it available to them. Were they interested in acquiring the work from you, or was it okay for them to just lose it into an object you're producing which then goes out into the world? Well, and that was good for them. That's a beautiful way to resolve the gesture of that failed marriage, if you like, or whatever reason they had for getting rid of that thing. The person that we're talking about has very good taste, so I can only assume that they want to acquire all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so any other technical detail or historical reference that you think we haven't spoken to regarding the work? Yeah, there, there is one. Um, would you pass me the closest of those three small pieces? Thank you. So the other part of this is that the front of the piece is a faithful reproduction of a painting. The back of each piece I, I hollow out by hand while it's in the wax. So these are the uh, traces of my fingertips. Um, you actually saw me working on, on something new, which is this piece of wax by the door, which you're all invited to check out. And uh, that would be the part of the materiality that we haven't discussed, that I, I, I empty these by gouging them. Mm. By gouging out hot wax, you know, it, it hurts. So your fingerprints are in the back? Yeah. That's your signature? Yeah, and we talked earlier about this being kind of a, a challenge or an affront to painters. Mm -hmm. and That's my if, favorite part. If there is a challenge to painters in this, it's that I've taken a painter's work and burnt my flesh 
making something out of it, and that they probably didn't. So it is, uh, in a way... Can I see your fingertips? These ones or these ones? These ones. Okay. Because um, <laughs> he was just doing it today, and they, they look all right. They weren't so hot. Maybe a little brown. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is, I think, an implicit challenge here, which is that, as we've mentioned, a portion of these are destroyed in the process. Some of them don't make it through the mold-making process. And I'm really looking forward to seeing a painting that I wouldn't try this with. All right. So that there's a challenge to painters there. Should Can we I? Pass? Yeah. Can we pass? Oh. If anyone wants to handle this, feel Ooh. free. It's, uh, this is one of those situations where this is not us treating the object uh, impreciously, but the simple truth of this is that this is so much stronger physically than any of us that even when we touch it, we hardly touch it. I think experiencing these physically is very important. That's you what know, sold me on them, honestly. I think, I think yeah. that's an important moment for anyone who hasn't experienced these before. The realization that they're quite serious, sturdy objects. And that's why I want this to be passed around. Uh, the inherent part of the work that's most compelling for me is that you're striving for eternity. You're striving for the eternal object, and there's a futility in it. And the erasure component, the lack of 2D that comes out of that, is this finalized object. Is this, this What do you mean by you? striving for eternity? Because I know that eternity is there. I'm striving Impossible to... Impossible I'm eternity. striving to engage with it, not to achieve it. Sure, okay. Which are very different things. I can't wait until everyone forgets that I ever existed and finds these, you know, on a beach. I think that's where they belong. I think they... I think so that for they're future, very nice in this context, but I think they're going to be future much nicer when they're just banned. Well, to dissociate all context and assume that 10,000 years from now, they can't look on Facebook and see that you did this. It's not <laughs> that I want to do that. It's that I believe that's what happens. I think that's nature, and I want to engage with and embrace and be in harmony with that. It's not about what I want. It's about what's going to happen. So a balance of ephemerality and eternity and permanence and erasure and... Mm -hmm all in one beautiful object in the sand 10,000 years from now. Just, I want to just brush it off. Mm, maybe for that person. Yeah. But for me, it's a matter of uh, grace and surrender and looking clearly at um, the shape of my life. Yeah, I've made a bunch of things that are going to outlive me. A lot of people do that by having kids or whatever. <laughs> uh, I, I've, made, I've made this group, this series of things that are going to outlive me drastically. 